All right, my name is Victor Cassone, and my talk's going to be about how we can use apprenticeships to strengthen the tech pipeline. Um, I've been kicking around the idea of apprenticeships for a while now, and this talk is kind of me uh, thinking out loud to you. So, as we all know, um, software and the internet's not going anywhere. Um, as time goes on, more and more people are going to come online. Uh, as you can see on the graph, that's I think this last year is 2014. Only about half the world's online. Um, over time, more and more people are going to come online. Um, also, Internet of Things, so more devices are going to be hooked up with software. Um, so what that means is, the more people using digital products, that means you need more people developing digital products. So what that's created is a shortage of developers. Um, and the demand for developers isn't going anywhere until AI can figure out how to take those jobs. Um, so as you can look at any job board, that um, a lot of companies are looking for developers. And the way developers are trained currently, I kind of broke it down to three main pipelines. So you have the university route, which is a little more traditional. You have a computer science degree, software engineering degree. Um, you go to school for four years. You learn about computer science and a bunch of other stuff. Um, at the end, you have a nice diploma that you can show to companies and get hired. Um, about five to 10, I'm not sure when they started, but coding boot camp started sprouting up um, across the nation. So these are three, six, nine months uh, full-time boot camps where you dedicate your whole life to learning some sort of technology. Uh, many times it's web development or mobile development. Um, and there's also uh, the self-taught route where you just decide you want to make something, um, you go online, buy some books, and try to figure it out for yourself. So I'm going to kind of run through the current state of each of these pipelines and kind of give you the pros and cons of each. Um, so the pros with the university is you cover a large breadth of material. So if you have a computer science degree, you, can, you might learn all the way down to the ones and zeros. And you might go all the way up to object-oriented programming. So there's a large, you, you see a lot. You see, you see the whole stack um, a lot of the times. Um, a university degree is highly valued by a lot of big companies. Um, the degree, the, the diploma you get at the end of your university career is valued a lot by a lot of big companies still. Um, and along with learning software development, you also learn, you have elective classes, so you also, also are more um, well-rounded. So um, you take other classes that are kind of related that might help you um, in the world. Um, a big con with the university route is really expensive. And over time, it's getting more and more expensive. Um, I don't even know. I think it's the student loan debt's up in the trillions or beyond that. I don't know where it is now. Uh, but it's going up and up. Um, and also, another con is uh, you spend a lot of time learning stuff that you might not use in the real world. So um, you could spend a lot of time working on virtual machines, but you might get hired as a web developer. So it's not unlikely that you can go through a four-year university and not know how to build a website. So you got the coding boot camp route. Um, so the pros with this is you learn a lot of material over a short period of time. Um, you're really using your time efficiently. Um, it's highly practical because you're, you went to school to be a web developer, and that's what, exactly what you're doing. Um, you're, late, you're really focused on actually building apps um, instead of talking about theory. So it's all practical. And compared to university, it's way cheaper, um, a fraction of the price. Short amount of time, less cost, so on and so forth. Um, a big con with coding boot camps is it's a short time span. Um, like anything, skills take time to develop. So um, you can learn a lot of foundational skills in a short amount of time, but you need time to develop and hone those skills over time. Um, and also, uh, many companies more and more warming up to the idea, but still a lot of companies don't value uh, coding boot camp degree the same as a four-year university degree. Um, but I think I, I get a sense the trend is moving um, in that direction where people are valuing that more and more. And then lastly, you have the self-taught route. So a big pro with this is you're focused on doing, you're trying to build something, you're trying to learn on your own. Um, you learn a lot of skills about self-sufficiency and you teach yourself, which is really valuable once you're out in the workforce. Um, there's a new framework, new library, new something every other week. So it's important to know how to, uh, know how to learn for yourself. Um, it also shows that you have a lot of interest in the material you're learning. Um, 
it's not easy to take a lot of effort in your spare time to learn something new um, and put the onus on yourself to figure it out. Um, a big con with self-taught development, it's very inefficient. Um, I know this from experience. I would spend, um, I don't know, weeks on something that could be explained to me in maybe 10 minutes. Um, so it's really inefficient. Uh, you kind of meandering around, um, trying to figure out the next thing in front of you. Um, you're, you're narrow in focus, so there's huge um, gaps of development that you just maybe don't know about or you didn't discover. Um, so you kind of your focus is too narrow to where you're not understanding everything, um, and the lack of guidance really hurts you because you don't even know if you're learning the right thing. You might, I mean, you gotta learn how to make a website, but are you doing it in the right way? Um, you're doing it the most eff efficient route. So, kind of I see it. There's a perception gap and a skill gap with all three of these pipelines. So, um, on average, um, I think all three of these have uh, a skill gap in. When you start a new job, you're always going to have to learn more. Um, you're going to have to learn domain knowledge, and your skill level might not be exactly where you want it to be. Um, sc schooling is not going to get you all the way, but I still think there's a gap there where uh, people coming out of these three pipelines could be a little more prepared for um, what's in front of them. Uh, so I think there's a big disconnect between what the job market needs and what schools provide, um, whether it's the four-year university where you might not even know how to make a website or um, code schools where you just need more time to really hone and develop those skills. Um, I think the job market, if you look at any job descriptions, um, they're looking for more experience and more can you do it, right? Um, another gap is the perception gap. So the self-taught and code school route, um, it, big companies or mid-size or a lot of companies still aren't fully on board with that route. Um, so there's, there needs to be some way to nudge them in um, that direction and being a little more acceptance of it. Um, so overall, I, I think the current pipelines are doing great, but I think there is uh, a little more that can be done. So enter apprenticeships. So what is an apprenticeship? Um, it's a person who works for another in order to learn a trade. And as I was researching this, uh, I learned that there is indentured apprenticeships, and that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so essentially what it is, is I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but um, you get hired on for some reason, or you, you join, you, you go find someone who has a lot of experience in a field, um, you start working with them, they give you small tasks that maybe they don't want to do anymore, or maybe it's busy work for them, but new experience for you. Um, so you spend time working under them, um, they give you tasks, and then you work on it, and there's feedback. Um, and I think this approach has been back since the beginning of humankind with blacksmithing and just an array of different uh, skill-based jobs. Um, and what it does is it uh, creates an environment where you can learn with real-world experience and also get a lot of feedback at the same time. And as we'll see, those two components are crucial when you're developing skill. So. That's not a slide. Um, so the next slide doesn't want to load. That's all right. Um, so this slide was going to have, uh, uh, what was it going to have? OK, so <laughs> I'll just move to this one. Um, so um, why apprenticeships are effective? So there's a bunch of research out there about skill acquisition, um, mainly by this guy, Anders Ericsson. Um, he's written a book ab called Peak about, he's kind of dissecting what he calls deliberate practice and the most efficient way to acquire skill. Um, I actually gave a talk about this at bar camp two years ago, and I kind of outlined what that process was, what it looks like, um, so on and so forth. I'm not going to go into specific details on this talk, but I think it's important to take a step back and kind of look at how skills are developed. So you can really break it down into six main components. So first, you need to deconstruct what you're trying to do. You have this big goal. You want to learn to say web development. Well, that's too big of a chunk to bite. So you need to break it down to individual manageable chunks um, that you can step by step um, move forward and uh, learn how to do something. Um, oftentimes, this is done by modeling someone with more experience. So if I want to learn to play basketball, I would need to go to find someone who's really good and see what they're doing right, because obviously, if they're that good, they're doing something right, right? So um, kind of dissect what they're doing, um, 
put it in my contacts, analyze it, and go from there. Um, so once you deconstruct what you're trying to do, you need to set up goals that push you outside your comfort zone. So these are called stretch goals. Um, the only way you get better at anything is by pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. So if I'm trying to learn piano better, if I keep playing the same song over and over again, I'm not going to get better. Reason being, I'm not pushing my abilities beyond what I can currently do. Um, so once you have your goals, you want to focus and you want to take action. Um, the key there is taking action. Um, it's, you can't really learn how to do something by looking at a blackboard. You actually have to get out there and physically do it. Um, so once you take the action, you need to get feedback on what was right and what was wrong. Um, and then you need to adjust how you approach your original action. Um, and then once you have the adjustment, you have the feedback, you need to repeat that over and over again until it becomes second nature. Um, and that repetition phase repeats a lot because it takes a lot of time to really um, get to where something is second nature. So how does this map to apprenticeships and programming? So um, if you were an apprentice in a uh, company, um, you would be able to model more skilled developers easily. Um, and this is really, programming has an advantage where you can actually look at their code and um, see how they approach certain problems. So you can learn from that. You can also learn certain tools that a more experienced developer is using, um, design patterns, mindset, all that stuff. You can really, just by looking at how they're developing or their code base, you can um, get a feel for how they got to their level. Um, it also sets up well with stretch goals. So when you're working on, in a real world environment, um, you know, you're working on real code. So you're gonna be, you're gonna be doing things you've never done before. <coughs> um, you're gonna be assigned tasks that you think you probably can't do. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so there's a lot of stretch goals. Um, you're working on real problems, so there's a lot of action. So there's a lot of you actually testing your skills. And um, there's a lot of feedback because you have someone constantly monitoring you, um, giving you adjustments, and allowing you to improve. So, did I move that slide? Um, okay, I, I don't know what happened to my slides. Anyhow, so how a program can work. So there's a lot of ways to approach this. This is just one that I just kind of thought of that makes a little sense to me. Um, so in a program, apprenticeship program in, um, for a software company, Maybe it's a one-year apprenticeship that acts uh, a lot like an internship, but it's instead of three months or however long they usually are, it's a year long. Um, each apprentice would be assigned a mentor um, where this person would look after them, um, set aside time for guidance, um, set aside time for answering questions, um, but also set aside time to provide continued educational work. So I imagine if you're coming out of a code school, maybe you still don't have a strong enough baseline of knowledge um, to uh, really make a difference and really uh, contribute code. So maybe there's some schooling work that needs to be available. Um, so I kind of imagine is, is both the apprentice and the company understand that this is a year long term. And at the end of one year, uh, both sides will sit down and assess how it went. So if the apprentice doesn't like the environment, they want to work there, they can leave, no strings attached, or if the company uh, just doesn't think they're a fit, you know, they could, it's, it's built into the structure, so you're not forced to be there any longer, but you still give it a year long, you give it a chance, um, and you can decide on the next actions after that. Um, so you have the classwork, and I would imagine over time, when you, when you first get there, it, it's gonna be, the mentor is gonna be watching over you pretty closely, but over time, um, more, more and more freedom is gonna be allowed. Um, resources that will be required. So nothing's free. So there's going to be time for the mentor, um, which is lost time working on the actual code base. Um, there's going to be, you need to set aside time to figure out what type of education they need. Um, you got to pay the apprentice. Um, and uh, you need time to train the mentors themselves. You can't just throw a developer and get more, a more experienced developer and say, hey, figure this out, right? Um, you need to optimize the way you're teaching someone. Um, so this kind of leads me into some pitfalls that could happen with this. So um, a lot of times 
when people try to find a more experienced developer, they look for, hey, who's the best developer at my company? OK, let's have them teach this new person how to code. But in reality is the, the best performers most of the time or some of the time aren't the best teachers. And a lot of the time, they don't want to deal with people. The reason they're so good at whatever they're doing is because they can go in a cave somewhere and figure out how to program, right? Um, so there could be a disconnect there between um, who you have the mentor and the, the false idea of the best one, the best programmer to say is the best mentor. Um, I mean, there's a real possibility that it might waste more time than it saves. Uh, so if, if the more experienced developer is spending their whole time watching over the person and they're not getting their own work done, and maybe the person under them is not learning enough, um, it could potentially be a bad ROI for both parties. Um, if, if it's structured poorly or if they don't adjust how they approach it. Um, I think there would be a little bit of a challenge finding a good project for someone with not a lot of experience to work on. So um, maybe there isn't a gap in the current website you're building or app that you're building that sets up well for someone with less experience to come on and more or less break things. Um, you can mitigate this by doing pull requests and making sure everything they do is looked after before they merge it in. But um, it's not a guarantee that uh, there's going to be a perfect place to insert them. And um, mentoring is one of those things that's easy and important to talk about in theory, but it's really hard to do in real life. Um, for anybody who's taught or, uh, I don't know, tutored anybody, it's easy to think you're going to be a good teacher, but then when you actually are in front of the person, Sometimes it turns into disaster. Um, so who would a system like this benefit? Um, so I think it's a win for all parties involved if executed well. So I think it's a win for the apprentice because they would get a year or however long of real world experience. Um, they'd be working on real problems, developing their skills in a structured environment, and their learning would be accelerated because, as we talked about earlier, there's a lot of feedback, a lot of action, um, a lot of stretch goals, right? And if you imagine the worst case scenario to where after the year they don't get hired on full time, well, the apprentice is still in a position where they have a year's worth of experience under the belt, which makes them a lot more marketable to the job market and it gives them more experience to land that next job and continue their career as a developer instead of stopping right at the point once you're out of school, right? Um, so I think it's a win for the company as well. Um, because they A, get access to top talent. Um, as the apprentice is coming through the system, they get familiar with all the domain knowledge. Um, they can train them in a way that's beneficial to their stack and to their code base, so they're not going to be learning obsolete things they need to be retrained later. Um, and it gives them first dibs on uh, whoever comes through. Uh, so it, it kind of helps increase the quantity of developers coming through the system. And I think it's a win for the city in general, specifically Omaha, right? So the more we can support more junior or right out of school developers or self-taught developers, um, the more tech talents can be available, which opens up entrepreneurship opportunities, which allows companies to make progress with, with whatever product they're developing. Um, so the more technology developers we have um, leads to better current companies, maybe new future companies, um, so I think it grows just the economy and everything else with that. Um, so kind of wrapping up here, uh, kind of the key takeaways. Uh, in my eyes, the current pipelines aren't working well enough. Um, the only way to fix something if it's not working is to try something new. So something new is needed. Um, I think apprenticeships could be that new thing. Um, and I think it could be used to fill the skill gap and accelerate learning and speed up the process of learning for everybody involved. Um, you know, it, it's not a perfect solution. You can't just drop it into the company and it's going to work, right? So um, it's not perfect, but I think if executed well, it could be really effective. And I think it'd be cool if a place like Omaha could uh, lead the way on something like this and at least give it a shot. Um, so yeah, that's all I had. Uh, I'll left time for questions if anybody has any.